go. There you go. That's great. So welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining rounds. Like I said, I'm excited that we rolled this out to our friends in Massachusetts and Connecticut as well. So wherever you are and certainly our Rhode Island group, thank you all for joining. Um, this picture is a picture of uh, Deb Singleton's uh, summer home in Falmouth. Um, just kidding. This is the, yeah, Deb, Deb helps me a great deal with rounds and, and deserves a home like this with a lighthouse. So, uh, but this is a Falmouth road race and we'll be talking a lot about that uh, tonight. So the title tonight is pre-hospital care of exertional heat stroke, cool first, transport second. And that's really the take home message. So if you want to stop paying attention, that's really all we want you to know. Uh, cool first, transport second. But again, we'll see why that's important. Uh, just a reminder to ev for everyone to mute themselves if um, if you're not already, um, so that we don't um, you know hear anything in the background. So thanks very much. So this is me. Uh, for those of you who don't know me or haven't met me, I'm a, um, a board certified ER doctor here in Rhode Island now for 20 something years. Um, I started my career in EMS in New York. Uh, I was an EMT and then a paramedic uh, back in the olden days. Um, starting around uh, 2002, I become the medical director of the Falmouth Road Race. And again, we'll talk a lot about Falmouth because this is where my experience with exertional heat stroke comes from. We've treated more than um, you know 400 and some cases of exertional heat stroke there. I'm on the sports medicine committee in uh, Massachusetts um, for athletics and the chief medical officer for the Corey Stringer Institute at UConn. So just a bit about Corey Stringer and the Corey Stringer Institute. Um, for those of you who have been around a while, Corey Stringer was a uh, lineman for the Minnesota Vikings. He's the only NFL player to die um, playing football. Uh, came close this year, but um, Corey is the only one who's died playing football. Um, it was August 1st, 2001. It was the second day of training camp in Minnesota. So for those of you who think that, you know, it doesn't, you know, don't have to worry about heat stroke in places like Minnesota, uh, it can happen even there. So it was particularly hot that August. The farmers were advised to keep their livestock inside because it was so hot outside. Um, but the Vikings uh, continued to practice. <clears throat> on day one, Corey collapsed. Um, and then on day, and then uh, day two came back to training camp and collapsed to, on the second day, and then ultimately died from heat stroke that day. So um, there was a settlement from the NFL, and they the settlement went to the University of Connecticut um, to form the Corey Stringer Institute, and that's where we're located now, University of Connecticut, um, for the past uh, 13 years or so. So um, it's really, you know, talking about preventing sudden death in sport and, and athletics and, and now laborers as well. So this is the Corey Stringer Institute. Again, I'm the chief medical officer there and, um, you know, again, proud to, to represent them. So again, my, you know, experience with exertional heat illness and exertional heat stroke comes from the road. Um, I became the medical director of the Falmouth Road Race since 2002. I've also worked at the Boston Marathon uh, the Run to Remember, which is a run in Boston during the, uh, on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, the Marine Corps Marathon, which is in Washington, D.C. in October. Uh, and then I mentioned the KSI affiliation. The other things, um, you know, this has led to a lot of other uh, opportunities. I've been um, hired as a, an expert witness in legal cases of uh, people that have succumbed to heat stroke. Um, I've worked on the um, Marine Corps Marathon uh, protocols uh, that we use sort of you know, for our defense department, um, all use the same protocols. I worked with World Athletics in 2019 on the World Championships in uh, uh, Qatar. And then on the for the protocols for the Tokyo Olympics, which were the hottest Olympics on record, uh, you remember in it was actually uh, 2021, summer of 2021. And we were at KSI, we worked with the uh, U.S. women's national soccer team to acclimate them for the heat that they we expected to see in Tokyo. Uh, and that's a pic, that's the picture that you see there for the, with the um, the women's team. Um, all this to say that, you know, not I've I've now kind of switched into the policy mode. Right. So, you know, we know about heat stroke, we know about the care of heat stroke, but now getting it to the level of EMS and other uh, you know stakeholders where we can affect policy. And it just, you know, I've done this lecture a lot. I've done it for rounds um, almost every year that I've been at, at Fatima. And I've also done it on a national level as well as other levels. And only to say that, um, you know, despite 
going around talking about this. And despite, you know, maybe some of you saying, yeah, we, we've heard this, we know about this. Um, I gave this lecture in April at the EMS Expo for Rhode Island. And in May, you can see on May 8th, um, a 27 year old guy died in Providence um, at the half marathon from exertional heat stroke. So, you know, the message still needs to get out there and we still need to talk about this because this is something that is, you'll see 100% treatable, certainly if we recognize it and treat it. Um, and, you know, this poor guy died, um, you know, a month after we given this talk. So our learning objectives tonight are, we'll talk about temperature regulation and heat illnesses, the heat illnesses that uh, you may see in these, in these folks. Um, exertional heat illness, of course, uh, including exertional heat stroke, which is, you know, the life-threatening part of it, and, you know, the treatment of exertional heat stroke, how that's going to um, affect people surviving, and then the role of EMS in the treatment of all this. So how can EMS be involved in this, and, you know, how are we going to um, get the message out there, and maybe even present a new paradigm for the pre-hospital care of uh, exertional heat stroke, something maybe you haven't thought about or haven't seen or, or haven't done. So, you know, when we, when we um, talk with EMS, and certainly, again, I've been in EMS, and, and the sort of the conundrum is always, you know, is this something that we want to scoop and run, you know, get to the ER as fast as possible, get to the hospital as fast as possible, or do we have some time to stay and play, right? Or there's some things that we can do on scene um, that are going to make a difference. Now, certainly, there are diagnoses that, you know, time is of the essence, right? We, you know, starting way back with with STEMIs, ST elevation, MIs, we know that, you know, heart is muscle and, and, you know, the quicker you get to the cath lab, the more heart you're going to save and stuff like that. So again, you know, ST elevation, MI, the race is on, you want to get to, um, you want to get to the cath lab. Um, more recently with stroke, same thing, right? You want to get people to a stroke center because we know that, you know, it is a timely event that you can make a lot of difference um, with stroke. So I would suggest too that uh, exertional heat stroke um, is one of these timely diagnoses where, you know, urgent care is important. So this is a study that was done in the 70s. This was done with rats, and you can see that they heated up rats, and then they just let them cool over time, and you can see the survivability really drops off after about 30 minutes. So we say that, you know, to be absolutely effective, we, we have about 30 minutes to diagnose and treat these folks with exertional heat stroke. So again, this is one of these timely diagnoses that, you know, you have to make right away and you have to start treatment right away. And we'll talk about that as we go on. So I'm going to present two different scenarios of exertional heat stroke, one in which you're prepared for it, like, you know, the Falmouth Road Race, um, and one where it becomes an emergent diagnosis. Um, and we'll talk about that. So this is, uh, you know, if you look in the southwestern sky in late August, this is the dog constellation or, um, and the dog star is Sirius. And when people saw this constellation, even as far back as 3000 BC, they knew that this, these were the dog days of summer, right? The dog star is Sirius, the dog constellation appears in the dog days of summer. That's where the name comes from. And even up until the 20th century, they noticed that, you know, during these times, these hot times, the dog days of summer is when... Um, you know, the, the, the appearance of Sirius brought out fever in men and madness in dogs, and it was actually introduced into the medical literature as a term called psoriasis, uh, which again was changed by the 20th century. But you can see that this is not new, right? As far back as 3000 BC, people were recognizing that there was a problem with the heat and, and people um, succumbing to heat. So again, not, not something certainly that I invented or we have just sort of realized. But fast forward a couple thousand years, this is the Falmouth Road Race. This is a race that was established in 1973. Last year, we had our 50th running, and it's a seven-mile race that occurs on the third Sunday in August. Kind of a weird distance, seven miles, but it started as a fundraising uh, race from one bar to another bar. So that's why the seven miles in Falmouth. Um, we, they register about uh, 12,000 or so runners and, of course, spectators in the hundreds of thousands uh, because it's a beautiful time of year to be in Falmouth. Um, all the medical care there is provided by volunteers. So, again, this is where we come in. This is the start of the Falmouth Road Race. If you've been to Falmouth, this is Woods Hole, and you can see that there are about close to 13,000 people ready to start the race in, in tiny Woods Hole. So... This was a study that was done in um, 
2004, published in 2004. This is in the Israeli military, and they looked at um, exertional heat stroke, and they said, okay, why are people dying from heat stroke? What are the reasons that people are dying? Um, one of the reasons is that, you know, physical effort unmatched to physical fitness. So you can see um, that was a common finding. And that's, you know, that's in the case of Falmouth or any other road race, this is your sort of weekend warrior, right? These are people who are, you know, maybe not well trained, not acclimated, and are going to go out at, you know, uh, out for their personal records. Um, this is also, you know, unfortunate people like Corey Stringer, who died, um, you know, because, you know, first or second day of um, practices, and they're, and they're doing things that they're not acclimated to do. So, um, this was one factor that was in common. And the other was an absence of proper medical triage. So you can see the importance of, you know, recognizing this, treating this, um, and then again, it becomes more survivable. So uh, our medical team, uh, you know, at uh, the road race is uh, sort of multifactorial. We have all um, specialties involved. We certainly work with the local hospital, the local EMS, are very much part of our planning as well as police and and uh you know certainly all our volunteers so really it takes a village you know to to do this kind of stuff and you know you have to be well prepared with your resources and know your resources um when you're organizing something like this um so this is a, a picture from our uh one of our races this is the medical team and we have about 200 people that volunteer for um for falmouth um, the volunteer page is open um, currently if anybody has the you know by the end of this if you think you want to do it um, certainly you can sign up to volunteer but again so we have about 200 or so volunteers we hold a training session on typically on the Thursday before the race um, to go over protocols and make sure everybody's on the same page um, etc and then we position ourselves in a place where we're going to do the most good. The big white tent that you see there in the center is the finish line medical tent. We also have four other course tents, including one at the start. Um, so we're positioned all throughout the race uh, where we know that people will get into difficulties. So what do we talk about at our you know, pre-race conference? Well, we talk about the six H's um, that can cause somebody to collapse. And um, if you remember these things, these are the things, again, um, you know, sort of a differential diagnosis of what would cause somebody to collapse um, or get into trouble at, a, at an activity like this. Now, certainly heat, you know, obviously that's what we're here to talk about. And, and the third Sunday of August is a primary concern for us um, with heat. Heart, you know, sudden cardiac arrest certainly can and does happen. Um, we've had one cardiac arrest at the Falmouth Road Race that was um, successfully resuscitated uh, with a with the immediate application of an AED, which really worked out for him. Um, but again, sudden cardiac arrest is, is, a, is something to consider. Hyponatremia or low blood sodium. Uh, these are for people that usually are, um, you know, drinking lots of um, tap water or plain water and, you know, depleting their sodium. Um, this is typically something you see after about four hours. So certainly in a marathon, this becomes more prevalent or more common. Um, we don't tend to see it in Falmouth because it is a short duration and short distance race. Hypoglycemia, certainly people who have diabetes or, you know, otherwise maybe didn't eat that morning or something, they can get into trouble with low blood sugar. Hemoglobin for sickling, people with sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease um, can get into trouble in the heat um, and certainly head injury as a, as a cause. Um, uh, hopefully we're not going to see um, at Falmouth. And let's face it, we're all EMS folks. We know that, you know, we got to throw in the seventh age for the holy crap stuff, right? We, you know, we prepare pretty much for everything. And you can see, you know, that something like that becomes important uh, when you think about Boston uh, 2013. Certainly, they didn't expect um, what happened that year. So, again, you got to kind of prepare for everything. So, when we talk about temperature, temperature regulation, um, our core body temperature is dependent upon the balance between heat production from metabolism and heat loss or sometimes gain from the environment, right? So it's just a balance of the heat we're producing and the heat we have to give off. Certainly if it, there's environmental heat stress, um, like in August, or if you're working hard outside, uh, it increases the need for heat removal. Heat production during intense exercise, such as running or something like that, it can be 15 to 20 times greater than at rest and can actually raise your core body temperature by almost two degrees um, Fahrenheit or a degree Celsius every five minutes if no heat is removed from the body. So you can see that 
you're, you can quickly heat up um, if you don't have the mechanism to, you know, release some of that heat or, or spend some of that heat. So what happens? How do we do that? Well, our physiological response is that we start to sweat, right? We've all been outside in the heat or, or worked hard in the heat and you, you start to sweat. What happens is blood diverts away from the internal organs, goes out to the periphery, and as the sweat evaporates, it cools the blood underneath. And this is our response to um, heat. And this is how we start to thermoregulate. What happens though, is when the metabolic heat produced by muscle during activity outpaces your ability to transfer the heat. So you've, you know, you've sort of um, outcome or overdone what um, is happening normally, the core temperature starts to rise to levels that disrupt organ function. So if you can't get rid of the heat that you're producing, then you, um, you know, your, your core temperature is gonna continue to rise. And what happens is you get almost like a reaction that happens with sepsis. You get an acute phase response. Um, it's multi-organ um, related and you get multi-organ system failure leading to death um, if not treated. So again, sort of similar if you think about sepsis and particularly the central nervous system is affected because the cerebellum uh, in the brain is particularly sensitive to heat. And that's why people collapse or stagger or lose their balance. Um, et cetera. So again, this is um, what happens when you overwhelm your ability to dissipate the heat. So what are some of the things we're going to see? Well, certainly one of them is uh, what we used to call heat cramps. We now call exercise associated muscle cramps because we don't think it's the heat that actually causes the cramping, but certainly people can get into trouble when it's hot and when they're exercising in the heat. And what happens is that, um, you know, you get these painful muscle spasms in the large muscles of the limbs and, and sometimes even in the abdominal wall. Um, we thought that it had to do with people who were, again, replacing their you know, electrolyte losses with hypotonic fluids, water, et cetera. Um, so again, this is um, exercise associated muscle cramps. So how do we treat that? Well, certainly you wanna get anybody out of the heat into a cool environment, start gentle static stretching. Um, one thing we do at the race is that we have, you know, physical therapists, massage therapists, chiropractors who can help people with these heat cramps by, you know, massaging and stretching, et cetera. You can also replace some of the um, electrolytes that they've lost with sweating, either orally or IV. Usually orally works just fine. If they do have protracted cramping, that's when you start to worry about things like hyponatremia. Again, um, not typically seen in our short distance race, but you know, anytime somebody's um, exerting themselves for hours at a time, such as a marathon, you want to start thinking about hyponatremia. Heat exhaustion, certainly that's the most common heat illness you're going to see, um, you know, uh, in the, in the pre-hospital realm as well. Um, it's just defined as the inability to continue exercise in the heat, right? You just become exhausted. And what it is, is the inadequate cardiovascular compensation secondary to a fluid depletion problem. So you don't have enough fluids, you don't have enough circulating fluid to compensate for this um, um, a, a problem. Um, the easy solution then is to just give fluids and the signs and symptoms usually vanish. So again, um, heat exhaustion and fluids. The, the symptoms of heat exhaustion are pretty nonspecific. Um, you know, people complain of feeling dizzy, weak, lightheaded, sometimes they're nauseous, sometimes vomiting, headaches, et cetera. Um, you know, again, just nonspecific stuff. But the important thing to remember is that their mental status remains normal. And of course, they're sweating a lot because they've been exerting themselves in the heat. Now, contrast this with exertional heat stroke. This is truly a life-threatening emergency. Um, and it is defined classically as a temperature of uh, greater than 104.5 with CNS dysfunction. So you need two things for heat stroke, right? You need a high temperature, high core temperature, and CNS dysfunction. And that's any alteration in, in mental status. Um, these people look horrible. They look like they're going to die. Their skin is ashen. They, again, it, uh, the heat affects their cerebellum. They lose hind limb function and they um, usually collapse or are unable to support their own weight alone. So um, again, two things for definition and, and certainly um, uh, people look, you know, look pretty sick, certainly. So what's the pathophysiology? Again, you're exposed to heat and then you have this acute phase response against the inflammatory response, very similar to what happens with sepsis is that, you know, once the cascade starts, it's, um, you know, 
certainly on its own to, to continue. Um, eventually, again, leading to multi-organ system failure and death if not treated. So this is the pathophysiology for heat stroke. And it affects all um, organ systems. Again, I, I said CNS is usually first because of the um, the actual susceptibility of heat um, on the on the brain tissue, but it affects all organ systems. So eventually, you know, everything is affected. And again, if not treated, it's going to lead to um, certainly disability or death. So uh, this guy in the bottom here, this is Hunter Knighton. He played for the University of Miami. He had a um, he had heat stroke and he was in uh, a coma for a few weeks because he wasn't treated, um, but did survive heat stroke. And he reminds us that, you know, when you hear about heat stroke, a lot of people think about probably you've probably learned about classic heat stroke where, you know, it's the older person who's locked in their apartment or uh, a baby or a child locked in a car. Uh, and there is a difference between classic heat stroke and exertional heat stroke. So again, classic is, you know, maybe what most of us have learned about or certainly heard about. These are people, you know, again, usually have underlying comorbidities, uh, which of course leads to a higher mortality rate. But again, these are the you know older folks who are locked in their apartment or don't have air conditioning, um, maybe during a heat wave or something like that. And, and they have what we call classic heat stroke. And they may present with hot, dry skin, um, you know, when you read the definition. As opposed to exertional, and again, this is in people who are physically active. So because they're active, there's gonna be sweating. Um, so if you say, well, you know, this person has sweaty skin, there's no way it's, it can be heat stroke. Well, that's not the case. Certainly with exertional heat stroke, people are going to be sweaty. And again, this occurs, we're talking about runners, but also, you know, firefighters, soldiers, laborers, uh, you know, people who are physically active in the heat. So, right. So we're talking about, you know, we're talking a lot about Falmouth. And, and again, we've learned a lot of lessons in Falmouth, but we're talking about all active populations. So people in sports, our laborers, uh, and we'll talk about them. And then, uh, of course, our military, which I said we've worked with the military as well, um, because these people have to be, you know, be able to be treated and, and perhaps get right back into the into the combat. Um, these are some examples of, you know, headlines of laborers, um, you know, firefighters, migrant workers, construction people. Um, again, if you're physically active in the heat, you're not exempt from, you know, the the uh, heat illnesses, in, including heat stroke. So again, I tell you that the two things you need for a diagnosis are an elevated body temperature and a change in mental status. So then the question becomes, do we need an accurate temperature? Um, and I'm going to say, yes, we do. And I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, it's going to tell us whether or not it is exertional heat stroke. Again, there are, you know, uh, there are only two things we need for the diagnosis. And if not, is it just heat exhaustion? Um, or is somebody you know, altered because they have a head injury, or they have hyponatremia, or they have a low blood glucose, um, or is it just you know, totally something else? If you look at this chart, this is you know, some differential diagnoses of, of people uh, who may have collapsed while active. And again, you, know, you can see the five things across the top that we've talked about. The only one of those things that has an elevated core body temperature is exertional heat stroke. So a core temperature that is not greater than 40.5 centigrade or 104.5 um, Fahrenheit is going to rule out exertional heat stroke. So again, the temperature is important. Um, the other thing it's going to tell us is when we stop cooling. And we're going to talk about cooling, folks, um, and, and the temperature is important so we know when to actually stop cooling. Um, and finally, to determine if exertional heat stroke occurred, because this is going to play a lot into recovery, especially with our athletes and war fighters and even laborers. You know, the question is going to be, you know, when can I go back to play? When can I go back to work? When can I go get back to the, uh, to the, um, you know, the battlefield, so to speak? So again, it's going to um, determine if exertional heat stroke has occurred and, and what kind of time frame we need to recover. So we have lots of options for assessing body temperature, axillary, you know, in the armpit, oral, tympanic, temporal, forehead stickers, ingestible thermistors, esophageal probes, or rectal um, thermometry. So what we need is something that's valid um, and also logistically feasible, right? We need something that's going to give us a, uh, the right body temperature assessment and something that we can do in the field or, or certainly in the ER. So valid temperatures, esophageal probes, urinary bladder um, temperatures, pulmonary artery temperatures, GI temperatures, 
these are all very valid temperatures, but certainly not something that's feasible for us to do, certainly in the field, maybe not even in the ER, right? So what is more feasible? Well, certainly oral, um, oral meaning the ear canal, temporal or axillary are all feasible, but they're really not valid. The only one that meets both of these criteria is a rectal temperature. And rectal temperature is what we use for core body um, temperatures at, at the road race. So if you look at rectal versus axillary, you can see that, you know, axillary is going to underestimate and certainly be way off, you know, by uh, a few degrees and certainly not give you an adequate, adequate um, core body temperature that you need for the diagnosis of exertional heat stroke. Same thing with oral. It's off by a few degrees. It's not, you know, not um, specific enough to give you the, the temperature you need. Tympanic, again, way off by, by um, several degrees. This is a study that we did in 2019. Again, we use rectal thermometry for everybody at the Falmouth Road Race. And this study that we did in 19, we did um, an infrared tympanic thermometer at the very same time that we took a rectal temperature. So we did both of them together. And you can see that if you relied on the tympanic temperature that you would miss all but about two cases of exertional heat stroke. So a tympanic um, thermometer is not accurate enough to diagnose heat stroke and you will miss um, a lot of cases if you rely on that. And temporal, uh, you know, swipe across the forehead thing, forget that. That really is, you know, um, what a colleague uh, of mine called a random number generator, which, you know, gives you a number that you can put on the chart, but it's certainly not accurate enough to, um, you know, diagnose exertional heat stroke or, or fever for that matter. Um, what are the, you know, current misconceptions? Certainly, you know, using a rectal thermometer, right? And I have, again, I've done this lecture a lot of times. And, you know, one of the sort of the hurdles, so to speak, is going to be getting people to buy into the fact that we need rectal thermometry or a rectal temperature for an accurate core body temperature. Um, and I hope that, you know, I can convince you certainly by the end that that is as important. Again, getting back to history, 1880s, um, this is a trade magazine that talked about the treatment of what they called sunstroke. Again, people who are out in the heat, the treatment must be instituted promptly and can be summed up in three words, reduce the temperature. So again, even back in the 1880s, they knew um, what to do with uh, what they called sunstroke or heat stroke. And they went on to say, you know, um, the person should be removed to a shady place um, and then his whole body, especially his head and chest, deluged with ice water. So again, this is, you know, 1880s, they're making these recommendations for the treatment of heat stroke. There's been lots of, um, lots of research since. There's been lots of research on different methods for treating heat stroke. Um, and what it's come down to that, you know, published in 2007, that cold water immersion is uh, what we consider the gold standard for exertional heat stroke. Um, and again, this is published 2007. And the, the key to maximizing the chances of surviving exertional heat stroke is rapidly decreasing the elevated core body temperature. Again, they, they knew this in the 1880s, right? So this is nothing new, but uh, you know, proven again by research and you know, evidence-based medicine. What they did is they looked at a bunch of different cooling rates. You can see on the bottom, you know, ice packs and over the arteries, et cetera, all the way up to ice water immersion. Um, the, the one that I found most interesting is about halfway through there, the helicopter downdraft. They actually use the spinning um, helicopter blades to cool people down. Um, you can see it's even better than putting ice packs in the groin. But, um, you know, the bottom line, again, this study showed clearly, you know, ice water immersion, cold water immersion is, you know, the cooling method of choice here. And again, the gold standard for, for cooling exertional heat stroke. Because of that, the American College of Sports Medicine, our military, U.S. military, the um, what is now called World Athletics and the National Athletic Trainers Association, NATA, all advocate the use of cold water, ice water immersion for the treatment of heat stroke. So again, lots of folks are backing this up. It, you know, again, it's the gold standard and, and people are using it um, because of the evidence. So this is what it looks like, really. This is a tub of um, ice water. And this is a particular, uh, this is one of the stations at, at Falmouth in the um, finish line tent. This is a Rubbermaid stock tub. We use a 50 gallon tub and it's made for, you know, feeding livestock um, and then filled with ice water. And that's it. Um, it's not much, uh, there's not a lot of technical stuff going on there and certainly not a lot of money, um, but this is the ice water immersion tub. 
And we have lots of them set up in Falmouth because we um, do see lots of heat stroke again. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, better to be prepared when this is going to happen. And I've talked about, you know, other races that I've done in other places that I've been and certainly um, other lessons that we've learned from the road. Uh, this is the Boston Marathon. If anybody has volunteered at the Boston Marathon, you know that the morning of the race before the race, um, you know, certainly starts and gets on its way towards Boston. Um, there is a medical conference held. And this is uh, Pierre Demacourt. This is one of the medical directors at the time. And he's given a lecture about um, what to expect with exertional heat stroke. And, you know, that slide should look very familiar because I just showed you the same one. So again, uh, you know, same thing in Boston, they're using the same, uh, you know, same evidence-based stuff for exertional heat stroke. The slide in the bottom right, um, although it's a uh, small and kind of poorly projected picture, that's a picture from the Falmouth Road Race. So the, you know, Boston Marathon uses the Falmouth um, as an example for uh, treatment of heat stroke. And certainly in Boston, you know, Boston Marathon is run in April um, in non-COVID years, certainly. Um, but in April, and you never know what you're going to get in April. In Boston, I was there in 2012. It was um, 95 degrees. I was there last year and it was about, you know, 50 degrees. So you never know. But they have treated heat stroke in Boston. And this is the um, medical tent in Boston on the left is the, what we call the A tent. This is the tent that is immediately at the finish line. Uh, and then you can see that they do have a heat deck there for exertional heat stroke with the tubs um, ready uh, in the event that they have heat stroke. This is the run to remember in um, also in Boston in May, this is Memorial Day weekend. And this is, um, uh, this is a sort of a weird finishes indoors in the uh, convention center. Um, but again, we use coal and immersion there um, as well. Uh, Marine Corps Marathon, you can see that they do things just a tiny bit differently. They kind of suspend the patient over the tub and then, you know, douse the water and the ice over the patient. But again, um, you know, coal water immersion is used by the Marine Corps Marathon and um, most of the United States military uses the same methods. And then other places, top left is New York City Marathon. I know that last year was like 76 degrees, I think, in, in the, um, at the New York City Marathon. They run the first weekend of November, uh, and they treated somewhere around uh, 22 heat strokes in uh, um, New York last year. Japan, lower left, Japan getting ready for the um, 2020, actually the 2021 Olympics. And then on the right is the Netherlands. We had the medical director of the Netherlands um, uh, from the Netherlands come to Falmouth in 2019. She um, learned about exertional heat stroke and brought it back to the Netherlands. Um, and they actually use it in the Amsterdam uh, marathon. And this is Tokyo 2021. This is, um, you know, uh, Dr. Yuri Hosokawa is a graduate, um, a PhD from KSI. And she actually headed the heat team um, in Japan for the uh, for the Olympics in 2021, um, and just uh, just as an aside, it was the first time that Japan has ever used um, rectal thermometry, and the first time they ever used cold water immersion uh, was at the Tokyo Olympics in 2021. So this is the tub. This is again, I don't you know have any um, uh, stock in Rubbermaid, though I probably should by this point. Um, this is a Rubbermaid. This is a 100-gallon tub. This is bigger than what we use. But you can see, you know, at the tractor supply uh, company, they were having a sale. Um, so 100-gallon tub for $69.99. So again, it's, a lot of, it's not a lot of money, certainly, um, you know, not a big expense for folks. And um, again, it's a lifesaver. There are, though, some misconceptions about the tub. And there are people that have been around a while and, and certainly some old timers in EMS who say, like, you can't you can't put somebody into ice water. It's a you know, they're going to vasoconstrict. They're going to store heat. They're going to shiver. Um, so one, you know, one of the misconceptions is that, you know, you're going to vasoconstrict and store heat. Um, and this is what we call the Curry response. So if you look at the graph on the left, um, if you put one of us who, you know, hopefully is normal thermic, if you put us into a tub of ice water, yeah, we, we are going to start to shiver and we're going to vasoconstrict and our body temperature is going to actually go up a little bit before it goes down. But you can see it goes up maybe not even a half a degree um, before it then starts to come down. Contrast that with the graph on the right. 
somebody who's 43 or, you know, say 109, 110 degrees, you put them in an ice water tub and it's all cooling. There is no vasoconstriction. There is no shivering. Um, actually, the, the paper that you put into the tub at 109 or so actually melt the ice. So there is no vasoconstriction to worry about. Shivering, again, there's no shivering when you're that um, hot, when you're actually melting the ice. Um, cardiovascular shock, you know, you say, well, you throw somebody in ice water, their heart's going to stop. You know, it's a shock to the system. And again, I have, um, you know, close to 500 um, case reports that that has never happened. So I, you know, I don't think that that is a possibility. Um, I mean, I guess it's a possibility, but certainly have never seen it happen. Can't administer other care. I'll show you a picture. Again, the reason that we use the 50 gallon tubs is that you do have great access to the patient. And then there is something called after drop, which um, when you put somebody in a cold water immersion tub, they cool, but they, even when you take them out, they, they sometimes continue to cool because the hypothalamus or the um, thermostat in our brain doesn't reset quickly enough and they may drop a little bit. Um, you know, we've had people go down to about 95 or so and they do get a little chilly. Um, but as I tell people, you know, you're not going to die from being chilly. You will die from heat stroke. So, um, you know, this does happen and, and may happen occasionally. So this is a, um, maybe not a great picture, but this is a mesh stretcher. And this is what we use at, at the races that I'm involved in. We, you know, you put the patient on the mesh stretcher and then you can pick them up and put them right in the tub on the stretcher. Um, it certainly beats trying to pick up, you know, um, you know, big sweaty people and, and trying to get them into a tub. So this is a, a helpful way to get people into the immersion tub. And again, this is what somebody looks like in the tub. You have great access to the patient. You can see their head, arms, legs, uh, you know, if you have to take blood pressures, et cetera, um, it, there's not too much to worry about because they're not, you know, totally submersed underwater. <clears throat> And it is a team event, right? If this is something that you're prepared for, or even in an emergency situation, this is a, a team event. You're not going to be by yourself, um, you know, supporting these people in a tub. Um, so again, it's you have good access and, and it's a, uh, a safe thing to do. This is a patient that we had at Falmouth who actually was completely unresponsive. He crossed the finish line and collapsed. His rectal temperature was 109. Um, he was completely unresponsive. We did have to support his head to, you know, make sure he didn't slip under the water. But he cooled um, and then was discharged home with his family um, from the tent. So again, just the importance of um, the immersion tub. So what is our protocol in Falmouth? And again, this is just an example, um, you know, how we do it and how, again, the lessons we've learned. Certainly anybody who comes in who uh, to the medical tent who is... Um, uh, brought in after they've collapsed or otherwise um, are triage with a rectal temperature. So we get rectal temperatures on everyone um, who, you know, uh, who are certainly altered and or collapsed. Um, that's part of our protocol. Patients are immersed in the tubs, half filled with ice water. I kind of showed you what that looked like, but this is another picture of a patient who's in an immersion tub. And again, you can see there's good access. Um, we cover them with towels to continue, you know, to cover as much body surface area as we can, because as I said, these patients are, you know, warm, hot, they actually start to melt the ice as we put them in. Um, just so you know, last year at Falmouth, we saw a um, young runner with a rectal temperature of 112.6. So that's the highest um, temperature I've ever seen. Um, he cooled and went home with his family that day. So um, again, uh, these are some of the temperatures. Vigorous massage is applied. Again, you want to, you know, circulate the water because they start to heat the water that's right next to their body. You want to circulate the water, cover as much body surface area as you can. Thus, the use of towels and massage and just kind of making sure that they are covered with the ice water. Rectal temperatures can be taken every five minutes or continuously monitored. We're fortunate enough to have what we call thermistors. So we put the thermistor in, it stays in for the entirety. We don't have to, you know, continually do temperatures. It gives us a continuous reading. Here you can see this patient was 105.2. Um, so again, we get a continuous reading um, with thermistors. If you don't have that access, you know, you, you can take patients out every once in a while to, to recheck their temperature. This is just a reminder, you know, 
about rectal temperatures again we get a lot of you know oh you're not putting that in my butt right or you're not you're not taking a rectal temperature on me um this is a guy who has a thermistor in place um he's he's getting ready to be discharged from the tent uh, and we had to remind him that he still had his thermistor in so it's you know once it's in it's really not all that obtrusive and 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 again people make a big deal of rectal temperatures and it's really um not that big a deal so just to show you that it's you know a pretty benign thing and then we remove patients when they get down to 103 um, or, you know, it's about 20 or so minutes in the tub, you know, if you do the math. But after, you know, they get down to 103, we take them out of the tub um, and then continue to monitor them. We keep the thermistor in because we do watch their temperatures to make sure they don't have a rebound hyperthermia or, again, get a little bit chilly. <clears throat> Typically, we watch them for about 20 or 60 minutes or so, somewhere in there. We watch them for a while to know that they are, you know, doing okay. If they're normal thermic, they have normal vital signs, they're, you know, they're cognitively well, they're taking PO, uh, they have a family or friend that can come and um, collect them, then we can discharge them from the tent. Um, very few patients require transfer to the ER for evaluation. Again, this is our protocol, and we're very comfortable with taking care of um, these patients. Again, I've been doing it for more than 20 years and a lot of my colleagues have been doing it for at least that or sometimes more. Um, so we're comfortable with this um, disposition plan. There are races, again, if you've worked at, uh, if you volunteered at Boston or some other races, they require that everybody goes to the hospital. And that's, you know, that's not always a bad idea, but it's certainly, um, you know, uh, you don't wanna overwhelm your local hospital. So this is the you know heat strokes by year again uh, in my time since 2002 to uh, last year you can see you know some years it's worse than others. Um, last year we had a particularly busy year we saw 46 heat strokes. Um, um, the record was or at least my record was back in 2003 and we saw 53. Um, it was uh, in the 90s that day with 100% humidity. So again it's you know obviously weather dependent, but certainly we've had our ups and downs. Um, the percentage that goes to the ER, again, we are comfortable with our protocol and, and comfortable with our personnel. Um, we've sent about 10% to the hospital, which means that 90% go home, right? So most people will go, certainly most people will go home from the site. Um, and again, it doesn't overwhelm the local ER. Um, and, um, uh, you know, they're discharged home with family or friends. And we do have discharge instructions that say, you know, you've been treated for heat stroke and this is what you need to look out for, et cetera. So, and follow, and we do follow up with these people um, uh, on discharge. So uh, at some point we said, geez, we got a lot of data here. We've looked, you know, we've done this for a number of years. Let's look at, you know, the effectiveness of this cold water immersion at, at Falmouth, you know, does it work and how does it work? Um, this was published in 2014. Uh, it's since been updated, but this was the uh, initial publication. We looked at, Again, um, you know, heat strokes during my time, and then we tried to search back as far as we could. Uh, the previous medical directors, you know, had a couple of charts here and there in their basement somewhere or whatever. Um, so we were able to get a bunch of, um, you know, a bunch of data together where we had about 274 heat strokes. Um, and you can see we average about two heat strokes per thousand finishers. So again, we have about 12, 10 to 10, 12,000 runners we're gonna see about 20 a year on average. So uh, again, it's a good place to learn about heat stroke. We looked at, um, you know, cooling rates for people who were, you know, real hot, maybe not so hot, male versus female, age groups, uh, you know, by age group. And you can see there really wasn't much difference uh, in all the age groups, men, female, whatever. Um, so again, everybody cools um, pretty uh, comparably. And again, in my, you know, 20 some years of doing this, um, I, we've seen 449 that we've collected over those um, uh, 21 races or so. And um, plus we were able to gather, like I said, about 91 cases from the previous medical directors. Um, the point of this though, is it's a hundred percent survivable, right? So if you uh, identify it and treat it, and for us, it's within the 30 minutes, um, it is 100% survivable. And that's the, the point of this whole thing. So when you get back to the EMS conundrum, you know, is this a scoop and run or is this a stay and play? 
um, we have to think about, you know, can we do this in the ED, right? So I work in a community hospital. This is a typical bed in a community hospital, maybe a typical bed in your typical ER looks somewhat similar, um, but obviously, you know, not a lot of room, not a lot of uh, space, no, certainly no floor drains, et cetera. So can we do this effectively in the ER? Um, so certainly if you're in Falmouth on the day of the road race, we have two tubs set up in the ER. Um, in case somebody bypasses the, our system of uh, medical care there and they get to the ER, there are tubs waiting. But how many ERs have, a, you know, have tubs waiting um, every day for exertional heat stroke? Probably none or slim to none, right? So, <clears throat> and the other thing is our temperature measurement. Again, this is the, you know, the temporal thermometer, the, what I call the random number generator, which really is not an accurate way to assess a core body temperature, um, certainly when it's really needed for um, hyperthermia. And again, it's you know, way off by degrees that is not going to be effective for us for um, core body temperature. So, you know, a lot of us were taught, okay, uh, heat stroke, you grab your ice packs, right? You put your ice packs over the major arteries, you put them in the axilla, you put them in the groins, you put them around the neck. Um, ice packs around the uh, major arteries is what we're going to do to cool people. And again, this is a, another study that was done or another review that was done in 2009, and it looked at various cooling modalities and it, and it defined them as acceptable, unacceptable, or certainly ideal based on their cooling rates, right? So it looked at a whole bunch of things, um, a whole bunch of ways to cool people. And certainly one of the ways was putting ice packs over the major arteries. And you could see that that is um, essentially an unacceptable way. It's just way too slow. Um, you're not going to cool somebody within that 30 minutes, and it's not going to be an effective cooling method. So we look around the ER, and we have these things called cooling blankets, right? So it's this blanket with channels in it that, you know, that machine over there pumps the cold water through the channels, and then you put that under the patient, and eh, it sounds like something that we could use for, uh, uh, for cooling someone. Although it's not even a not even a blip on the on the graph, right? So this is certainly a very unacceptable way to do it. The cooling blanket is just way too slow. You'll never cool somebody within thirty minutes, and you're certainly not um, going to help somebody with survival with that. How about cold IV fluids? Um, that's a good idea. We'll put IV fluids in the refrigerator, and then when somebody comes in, we'll start an IV and we'll give them cold fluids. Um, well, that doesn't work either. Um, the unfortunate part about this is there was a study done in the military where they started an IV in the in the wrist or hand and then measured the temperature up in the uh, area of the shoulder, measured the temperature of the blood there. Um, and they found that by the time the cold IV fluid got from the hand to the shoulder, it was already warm to body temperature or above. So this is not going to be effective um, to use cold IV fluids on someone with uh, exertional heat stroke. What about rotating cold towels? Just taking towels, dipping them in ice water and rotating them out as they start to get warm. Um, this is actually an acceptable thing to do. And, and for people who you know, have no other um, access or have no other way to start cooling someone, this is actually recommended. So you know, if you are at an event or at somewhere where you know, somebody happens to have a cooler of ice water, uh, you know, perhaps at an athletic event where they're drinking out of the, you know, the, you know, the big cooler of ice water, you know, dunking towels in there and rotating them until they, you know, um, as they get warm um, is an effective way or an acceptable way to start cooling somebody. So this is a, a good acceptable start. But we're, you know, EMS folks and we think outside the box, right? We um, typically think of, um, you know, other ways to do things. We're innovators. And this is the TACO method or the TARP assisted cooling method or TACO method. Um, and what you do is you just take an impervious TARP um, you fill it with ice and water and you put the patient in there and you kind of just shake them around, um, you know, like a, in a taco fashion. Um, and this is a pretty effective cooling method. So again, if you don't have a tub, if you have a tarp you have, and the ice and water, you can certainly make it work um, with the taco method. Now, I would um, add to that that we have these things in the ER. These are, you know, what we call body bags, right? This is the postmortem kit. This is a um, water impervious uh, bag that zips open, and this then becomes the burrito method, right? So the taco method with the tarp, burrito method like this. We've used this in our ER and in other ERs where you put the patient in there, you put some ice and water in there, and you swirl them around 
um, and you can effectively cool somebody and, and contain your mess. So it works pretty well. This is a great uh, method to um, use. The tarp method or the um, burrito method are, are certainly ideal or, or uh, very acceptable or ideal methods of cooling somebody because the cooling rates are um, in that great range. So you can see this was written up in uh, 2019. They used a body bag in California. This is somebody who suffered from heat stroke and they put him in a body bag with um, ice water immersion and um, wrote it up as a case report. Um, so again, this is something that's being used and something that works. Again, you know, this was um, 2021, a uh, headline that they're using body bags to save lives. So here's the problem, right? This is my ice machine in the ER. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, you get a cup of ice at a time when you press the button. So I'm gonna need a heck of a lot of ice, right? And and believe me, I hear you, you know, EMS folks when you say, yeah, that's great, but where are we gonna get the ice? And I do uh, appreciate that. And, and certainly sometimes that is a problem, certainly even in the hospital, you know, again, this is my ice machine. You may have to say, okay, can we get to the cafeteria? Is the cafeteria open? Does the cafeteria have an ice machine or do we have access to ice? Um, I had a colleague of mine uh, in the ER who had somebody with heat stroke. They wanted to cool in the ER. They sent somebody to the cafeteria and the cafeteria couldn't figure out how they were going to charge the patient for the ice. Um, so there was a delay in getting the ice. So again, I hear you when you say, okay, where are we going to get the ice? But again, you know, a little bit of pre-planning, especially EMS folks who I know are, you know, very innovative, uh, you know, 7-Eleven, Dunkin' Donuts, um, you know, local restaurants, um, people with ice and just know where you can get ice and, and have access to ice if you do need it. So back to that graph, again, this is a timely diagnosis, right? This is something that we need to make the diagnosis and start treatment. And again, within we know that within 30 minutes that it is 100% survivable if we if we do the right thing. So they took another look at this and said, you know, not only is it, not only is it important to cool somebody, but we want to cool them before we transport them. And that's where this whole uh, mantra of cool first, transport second comes from. So again, you know, cooling somebody first before you begin transport to the hospital um, is going to be more effective. Let's look at this um, case study. This is a tale of two heat strokes. This was a comparison of two heat strokes that occurred at the Marine Corps Marathon. And you can see the guy on the left, the dark circles, <laughs> excuse me. He was a patient who finished the marathon and he collapsed at the finish line, was brought immediately to a medical tent. You can see they got a rectal temperature um, immediately and then started cooling. And then within 30 minutes, he was cooled um, down to a safe temperature and he was able to be discharged from the medical tent. Patient number two, you see on the right, the gray squares. This is a patient who collapsed at mile 24 of the marathon. And what happened to him? Um, well, they called EMS. EMS picked him up and brought him to the local ER. Um, you can see that it was an hour before they even got a temperature and then started to cool with ice packs over the major arteries and a fan, um, et cetera. And you can see that it was a very slow cooling rate and it took them um, you know, more than an hour, an hour and 20 minutes or so to cool the patient um, to a successful range. This patient, the second patient ended up with um, kidney failure, liver failure, uh, in a coma. He was on the liver transplant list but fortunately recovered and survived without a transplant, um, but spent you know, multiple days in the hospital and was not able to go back to his military career because of the heat stroke. So again, you can see the two, you can see the differences in someone who was treated immediately and within that 30 minutes and somebody who was not and the differences in outcome. This is probably my favorite story. This is Gavin Class. This is a kid who played for the University of Towson football. He was in practice. Uh, there was an athletic trainer there. They had a tent and a cold water immersion tub standing by at practice. Um, Gavin um, collapsed. Uh, he was immediately identified to have exertional heat stroke. He was brought to the sidelines, put in the immersion tub, and the athletic trainer called 911. The ambulance was right across the street from the field, literally got there in you know four or five minutes. And when they got there, what did they do? Well, they pulled Gavin out of the tub and they said, nope, we have to get him to the hospital as soon as possible. 
Um, Gavin was in a coma for, he arrived to the ER with a rectal temperature of 109. He was in a coma for seven weeks. Uh, he had uh, renal failure, liver failure. Um, he ended up having 20 surgeries, including a liver transplant. And unfortunately, he was never, never able to play football again. Um, Gavin did survive. Um, he is a um, strength and conditioning coach now out in Colorado. Um, but again, you can see that you can see the outcome of uh, what we would call delayed care, right? So, um, and he he had care that was instituted immediately uh, and would have been right for him. Um, but he, you know, succumbed to a lot of problems. So as we know, EMS is protocol driven. Anybody who you know works in EMS, you know that you have protocols and you have to follow protocols. Um, and we absolutely you know advocate for that. Um, I'm going to switch gears a minute and just have you think about cardiac arrest. Probably the worst, uh, certainly the worst uh, diagnosis you could probably have. Right? This is um, you know something that you. Um, um, this is probably the worst case scenario for someone, and and certainly you know they need prompt attention. But imagine, you know, 20, I think it was 2017 in Rhode Island, where I'm practicing in Rhode Island, and they said, um, you know, we've changed the EMS protocols, we are going to stay on scene with someone for 30 minutes, um, you know, in cardiac arrest, uh, before we bring them to the hospital. And at first, I thought, what, this is, this is preposterous. I never heard of anything uh, like this. What is the evidence? Well, the evidence came out of this article that was done in Japan, and they showed that they were, you know, tens of thousands of patients that actually did better if you stayed on scene for anywhere from 30 to 42 minutes. So you stay on scene with someone um, in cardiac arrest um, before you transport, because what do they need? They need good quality CPR and, and perhaps an AED, right? They, they, there's nothing more than I could offer um, in the ER than that, right? So they you stay on scene 30 to 42 minutes and people are going to survive. And they showed, you know, in North Carolina, they started doing it. And, and look at this, people are walking out of the hospital after, you know, um, cardiac arrest. So this is, this is crazy. This is, uh, you know, something that we're going to change the, the face of, of what we're doing. So certainly, again, you know, back, uh, you know, several years ago in Rhode Island, we changed the protocol that says that, you know, somebody in cardiac arrest, um, we are going to wait 30 minutes on scene. Um, before we transport them to the hospital. So I would say, you know, if we can do this for cardiac arrest, if we can wait on scene for 30 minutes with somebody in cardiac arrest, um, can we do this with somebody in heat stroke? Um, and we can, and we did. So this is a protocol that we wrote for Connecticut. And it says, uh, it says exactly that, that exertional heat stroke, if it's identified with a rectal temperature um, and, um, you know, you will stay on scene um, until the patient is cooled to a safe temperature of, of 10. This says this protocol is 102. So you will, you know, cool on scene before transporting. So cool first, transport second, um, before, you know, the patient is cooled before they're transported. It also says that if you come on a scene where someone is being cooled, you know, a case like Gavin's, you allow the, the um, medical personnel, the athletic trainers, whomever, to um, cool that patient to a safe temperature before you transport. So this was a, the first one of a kind um, protocols that we wrote for Connecticut um, regarding exertional heat stroke. This is Maryland. Um, Maryland, um, not as um, thorough, certainly as Connecticut, but it does say that if you come on the scene of somebody who's being cooled, you will stay on the scene until they're cooled before you transport. Massachusetts, same thing. This was recently added um, that you, um, you know, patients um, will be, um, you know, if you come upon a scene where somebody is being cooled, you stay on scene until they're cooled before you um, transport. And there is a new Massachusetts protocol. I apologize, this is the older one, but at least, but it does say the same thing that if they, you know, if they're being cooled, you stay on scene um, until. Um, they're, they're cooled. And then Rhode Island, um, you know, not quite there yet. I've proposed this to Rhode Island a couple of times now um, that we changed the protocol. And I'm promised that it is in the works for the next, um, you know, protocol change session. So again, we've talked a lot about the Falmouth Road Race. Again, lessons we've learned there, but what we're dealing with is, you know, active people, right? So people who are active in the heat um, certainly can um, also fall 
pray to the um, exertional heat stroke. Let's think about our laborers. And this is a study that we worked on. Um, there's a couple of things here that uh, one that has been published and one that we're still working to get published. But it was shown that, you know, more than 87% of exertional related deaths were heat related in laborers. Now, clearly the clear, the, you know, the number one cause of death in laborers is accidental, but in the non-accidental people, you know, more than 87% of them were exertional. So, um, and heat related. So you can see the importance of, um, you know, covering our labor force and certainly labor populations are going to rely on EMS, right? I mean, they don't have people standing by with a tub, they're going to, you know, if something happens, they're going to call 911. So we looked at the state guidelines, we looked at 52 states, including DC and Puerto Rico, and only 30 of those 52 have statewide EMS guidelines. Only nine of those recommended cold water immersion and only eight recommended cool first transport second. So that means that about a quarter of the US population is covered by what we call best practice, right? So they, you know, of the states that have statewide guidelines, a very small amount of them um, mention cold water immersion or cool first transport second. We also showed that in the states without best practice protocols, the labor deaths are three and a half to four and a half times higher than states with best practices. So it sort of infers that, you know, if you do have a protocol that that talks about um, heat stroke and cold water immersion, that, you know, your laborers are certainly going to be better off than not. <clears throat> And you say, okay, that's great, but now we have to rewrite our protocols. Well, that's already been done too. Uh, in 2017, uh, the National Association of State EMS Officials, or in the SEMSO, published a model um, EMS clinical guidelines um, with regards to cold water immersion and cool first transport second. So this has already been done in 2017. Um, this is the national EMS guidelines, and again, um, written uh, you know, for people to, you know, cut and paste or borrow or steal or whatever. Um, but this has already been written for cold water immersion and um, cool first transport second. So you can, you know, easily get the protocols from the national model. So again, we know that only about uh, a quarter of the United States uh, or the states are covered by, you know, EMS policies that have adopted these guidelines. So this is 2018, we got a bunch of VR doctors together and we came up with a consensus statement, you know, what are we going to tell people or what is our sort of, um, you know, what is our bottom line for pre-hospital care of exertional heat stroke? Um, and it's really four things, right? And this is the sort of the new paradigm or the, or the paradigm for the care of exertional heat stroke. Racket, sorry, rapid recognition, rapid assessment, rapid cooling, and rapid advanced care. And it's just those four things. And using those as a uh, as a way of summarizing this thing, um, so rapid recognition. Again, you got to recognize exertional heat stroke. You have to first think about it and certainly recognize it. Um, and again, you need two diagnostic criteria: a temp, a high temp, and an altered mental status. Now, the temperature it may change, you know, based on who you read or what you read. Um, but the, you know, there may be 104, 104.5, uh, 105 sometimes. But again, it's a high body temperature, high core body temperature, and an altered mental status. Two things for diagnosis. Um, and the importance of rectal temperatures. Again, I realize the hurdle that this uh, represents. You know, it's invasive, it's dirty, it's this, that. But again, remember as, as paramedics and, and EMTs, you, you know, you're trained for childbirth, right? You're chain, trained to deliver babies. So, um, you know, this is... Uh, certainly a, a less invasive uh, procedure just to erect the temperature. And it can be done, you know, very um, confidentially and privately. And, and you know, it's not um, a big deal. Again, remember the guy who was, you know, standing there with the thermistor and waiting to be discharged. He, he forgot that it was even in there. Cold water immersion, again, cold water immersion, the gold standard for exertional heat stroke. And if you don't have a tub or can't use the tub, certainly the TARP or burrito method, the taco method or burrito method are certainly acceptable methods um, for cold water immersion, um, you know, for cooling. Just remember to, again, to use a um, something that is in the acceptable range. And, we, and again, that's, you know, taco, burrito, tub. And then cool first, transport second, the importance of cooling someone um, to a safe temperature before transporting um, to be sure that they're cooled before they get anywhere. 
So back to our EMS conundrum. Is this a uh, scoop and run or is this stay and play? Well, I hope that I've sort of convinced you that this is more of a stay and play. Again, like cardiac arrest, you stay on scene and do what's best for the patient before you start to transport. Um, you know, this is a uh, cool first and transport second is a is sort of a stay and play diagnosis. Um, again, I know that, you know, EMS people are innovators, um, you know, you think of things out of the box, and certainly this is, these are some pictures, pictures out of um, Austin, Texas. Uh, you can see this is a shopping cart with a tarp uh, in it, and then some cold, you know, water and ice in the, in the shopping cart. This was their cold water immersion tub that they, um, they devised. Also out of Austin, Texas, this is, you know, one of those people movers or, you know, body, body movers, um, and they use that uh, with a tarp uh, with ice and water for cooling, uh, and it looks like they attempted to cool during transport, which uh, is a pretty novel but messy idea, but certainly um, the, you can see that they initiated cooling. And then finally, you know, again, you know, the picture on the left, we certainly can't do that on the in the picture on the right, uh, certainly not if, as effectively. So again, cool first, transport second is sort of the take home message um, for this lecture. <clears throat> this is, um, Corey Stringer, this is KSI. This is our website, ksi.ucon.edu. And I only me I mentioned it because there are lots of things on here, lots of drop down stuff that, you know, could be helpful to you. Um, heat illness, concussion, a bunch of things. Um, but we also did this educational video. This is the pre-hospital care of exertional heat stroke. We, the NFL um, sent their production team um, over to, to UConn. We actually filmed it at Gillette Stadium. It's a 12 minute video, but it shows, you know, somebody collapsing the care of heat stroke and um, right down to the, um, you know, EMS arriving and waiting and, and stuff like that. It's a, uh, it's done with actors, but it is a, um, Again, a, a good educational video, a 12-minute video to watch uh, if you're interested. Of course, we're on social media. I just throw that in there. Um, the other thing we did is we worked with Prodigy EMS um, last year. We um, had a crew from Prodigy EMS come to the Falmouth Road Race last year, and they filmed actual heat stroke patients and heat stroke encounters um, and then got consent from the patients afterwards um, and did a one-hour video about <clears throat> heat related emergencies and exertional heat stroke with um, actual patients from the Falmouth Road Race. So if you can't be there or um, haven't been there and or want to be there this year, again, I, I urge you to, you know, take a look at this video. This is, again, this is an hour video, but it's, you know, great, um, um, great footage of, of what happens there. And then there's this. This is certainly not for self-promotion, but I do want to mention this. This is, uh, you know, I gave the lecture for the EMS um, uh, Expo in Rhode Island in April. Um, they had the, um, this was sent to me by a lieutenant from the Newport Fire Department. They had the Newport um, half marathon and someone collapsed and they saved his life by, you know, um, diagnosing exertional heat stroke and treating him effectively. Um, the the uh, lieutenant who wrote me said that he would have probably never have considered the diagnosis of exertional heat stroke until he heard this lecture um, and, you know, took a rectal temperature. The guy's temperature was 107. They cooled him on scene and then the guy was able to be discharged from the hospital. Again, um, you know, kudos to the Newport Fire Department for doing this. And, um, you know, I guess the the uh, the take home message is I'd rather see, you know, headlines like this than headlines like this. And certainly, you know, anything we can do to help, you know, promote the, the treatment of exertional heat stroke and the survivability for patients um, is um, beneficial. And, you know, if just one person gets the message like they did from that previous one, then, then I've done what I'm supposed to do, but I certainly would hope that, you know, um, this helps people with certainly recognizing treating and, and saving people from disasters like this. So with that, I'll conclude, I'll put up my, um, this is my email. If you have any questions, concerns, other thoughts, any questions, I can, I'll certainly open it up to questions now. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to kind of do chat at the same time, but I'll look at the chat as well. Um, but if you have any questions, you can certainly unmute yourself and ask or put it in the chat box. I'll, I'll be happy to take a look. But otherwise, you know, again, thanks for attending. Thank you to uh, our Rhode Island folks. Thank you to Connecticut folks. Thank you to Massachusetts folks. And wherever you're from, I certainly 
appreciate you signing on and um, um, giving me your time to learn about um, something I'm very passionate about and certainly I you know care a great deal about. So I think that, um, again, thank you for listening and um, I'll open it up to questions.